Adrift, the second episode of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, centers on our responsibility to one another. An elf must trust a human, an elf and a dwarf mend an old rift, and a harfoot meets a stranger who has fallen from the stars. Beware, spoilers ahead. Galadriel, alone in the middle of the sea, her ship and those on board safe behind the veil of clouds in Valinor. She starts swimming. Meanwhile, Nori is staring at the unconscious figure in the burning crater when she is startled by Poppy and falls into the seemingly not hot hole. She pokes the beardless mystery man in the face. Nothing happens at first, until he grabs her wrist and moans. The wind howls, circling Nori and the stranger. The rocks float into the air, forming a strange solar system around the two figures. The fire is suddenly sucked into the center and vanishes, after a brief moment, he collapses and the fire reappears. The girls transport the unconscious man through the night using a stolen wheelbarrow and lamps, looking for a safe place to keep him. Is he some kind of troll? No. An elf? Wrong ears, and he's not particularly attractive. Human? No way, he'd be squished. But they can't argue for long because the wheelbarrow escapes and rolls downhill. They hide the stranger in a clump of trees after capturing the errant wheelbarrow. Nori begs the skeptical Poppy in language reminiscent of Galadriel's own driving sense of duty. I feel responsible for him. I was supposed to track him down. Before she can walk away, she needs to know he's safe. Arondur and Bronwyn in Hordern, Bronwyn's demolished hometown. There are no bodies, no injured, and no evidence that anyone was present during the destruction. They appear to be alone in the smoky darkness as they creep through collapsed and still smoldering houses. Arondur discovers a deep pit and passage dug beneath the floor of a ruined home, clearly purpose-built by someone, or something. Arondur sends her off to warn her people with one last longing look before leaping down into the tunnels, torch aloft. Aragian, the realm of the Elven Smiths, is a city of towers built into an island's mountainous side. He tells Elrond about his project in Celebrimbor's chambers. Celebrimbor wishes to fill Middle-earth with beauty rather than war, and to create something of true power. He has brought Elrond here to assist in the construction of a forge with a fire as hot as a dragon's tongue and as pure as starlight. However, he needs it completed by spring. Elrond suggests looking for partners outside of our own race. With that, the map snakes up to Khazad-dum, the dwarven realm. It will become an orc infested, Balrog cursed, desolate tomb thousands of years from now. But, even in the Second Age, streams still flow to the mines, which are surrounded by lush green mountains. Elrond assures the smith that Durin, the dwarven prince, is like a brother, but the guard at the stone door quickly dispels that notion. Elrond has another trick up his feathered sleeve, he performs the rite of Sigin Tarag, which causes the doors to open unexpectedly. Elrond is rushed in alone and sees the mines in all their glory, waterfalls, green cliffs for farming in rays of sunlight, and a bustling underground metropolis carved into the mountain's belly. Prince Durin IV dismisses Elrond's flowery language about their friendship in order to introduce the dwarven endurance test. They'll hammer stones until one of them can't anymore. Elrond is exiled if he forfeits. If he wins, they will only grant him one favor. Nori discovers the stranger scribbling on a nearby boulder. He turns and yells, and the trees around him bow down to him. Don't you remember me? Nori begs. Something within him causes the world to return to its natural state. They form a friendship through creative hand gestures and, frankly, disgusting snail eating. Where exactly are you from? Where do you fit in? Where have the others gone? Like you? Are there any others? Nori inquires. In response, the stranger begins drawing a symbol in the mud, similar to those carved into the trees. He speaks in an unknown language, repeatedly repeating the words mana and yur with increasing urgency. Meanwhile, Nori's father, Largo, is assisting with the installation of a canopy at camp. Largo's ankle gives way spontaneously at the height of the stranger's agitation. His foot is in bad shape, and the entire camp is worried about whether he'll be able to migrate. Galadriel is still swimming in the thick grey fog when she hears a bellow. When she sees a dilapidated raft, she is dragged aboard. Galadriel simply states that she became separated from her ship. 
So you haven't seen it? Eamon inquires, his voice trembling. What about the worm? Before either of them can respond, the passengers notice a ship in the distance. Is it salvation? Corsairs? It is neither of the following, it's their own wrecked ship, dragged through the sea by the dreaded worm, an enormous creature with water-slicing fins. One of the passengers panics and shoves Galadriel back into the sea. We see the destruction every time she comes up for air, the worm circling back, its huge jaws rising out of the sea to chomp down on the raft, its many fins ripping through the raft, sending debris and people flying. The sea then becomes still and silent. The last remaining piece of the raft cuts through the fog in the distance, rowed by Halbrand, who pulls her aboard. Back in Khazad-dum, that bond is crumbling like the many boulders Durin and Elrond are ferociously hammering until Elrond gives up. Elrond discovers how he's offended his former friend as they ride up a rock face to the exit, twenty years to an elf may be a blink of an eye, Durin exclaims, wounded. But in that time, I've lived an entire life. A life you squandered. Elrond only offers his congratulations on the achievements he's missed, as well as a request, he'd like to apologize to Durin's family as well. Disa, Durin's wife, welcomes Elrond with an overwhelming warmth that her husband cannot provide. She tells Durin how she met him over dinner, she was resonating, a technique used by dwarves to learn what might be hidden, where to mine, where to tunnel, and where to leave the mountain untouched. Elrond is charmed by their affection at home and notices the yellow linden tree that grows inexplicably in the room. Where there is love, there is never true darkness. In a home like yours, how could it not grow? Elrond inquires. Durin instructs Elrond to remain. On the high seas, Galadriel wonders what kind of man abandons his companions to drown, while Halbrand suspects her of deserting. She inquires as to what elves have ever done to earn his hatred, but his response chills her, it wasn't elves who drove me away from my home. It was the orcs. As a storm approaches, darkening the already grey sky even more, he reveals that he is from the Southlands. We know where Halbrand has fled, and now Bronwyn does as well. Her news is met with skepticism at the tavern. Waldreg will not flee on her word alone, he's seen landslides less dangerous than a wayward tongue, and the tongue of a woman who believes in elves isn't worth much in this town. At home, however, Theo hears mice under the floor. He attacks the floorboards, only to see an orc's ice blue eye peering back at him through the hole. Arondor is still crawling along the tunnel when he notices the spindly shadow of a creature he most certainly does not want to meet on the wall. As he squeezes through a passageway and slides down into an underground lake, rats scurry by. He scrambles to the beach and scans the water's surface, ready to strike. He is caught off guard by the long fingers that emerge from the roots behind him and yank him away. When Bronwyn arrives, her house is in ruins, with a pit in the middle of the floor. She discovers Theo hiding in their walls, then flees into the closet opposite, just as an orc with clawed fingers, raspy breath and a skull-clad head emerges from the hole to prowl their room. Bronwyn is grabbed by the orc who bursts through the closet doors. They fight, the orc is ferocious, but Bronwyn and Theo are resourceful and unflappable. When we see the orc again, it's just a head slammed onto the tavern table as proof and or pudding, as Waldreg requested. If any of you want to live, we make for the elven tower at first light, she declares before storming away. Galadriel and Halbrand are in the midst of an adventure. The waves lash and roil their shaky raft, and they must work together to keep it, and each other, afloat. Galadriel has bound herself to their makeshift mast and instructs Halbrand to do the same. But, before he can, the raft disintegrates and Galadriel sinks into the water. Halbrand severs the rope that binds her to the anchored wood, causing them both to thrash to the surface. Nori has arrived near the Harfoot camp to inform the stranger that they will be migrating soon and that she will be unable to assist him. His strange magic causes the fireflies in their lanterns to burst free and spill upwards like embers from a fire. He whispers softly in an unknown language, and they form a yellow constellation in the sky. Nori understands, he needs their assistance in finding these stars. The firefly in Poppy's palm dies, and all the twinkling yellow lights blink out after the still weak stranger collapses. In Khazad Dum, Prince Durin informs his father that Elrond is unaware of the dwarves' possessions. King Durin III, 
with skepticism and a truly magnificent waist-length gray beard, is skeptical. Hammer and rock cannot be trusted, he warns his son. One or the other must inevitably fail. A box is opened in front of them by two guards. We can't see what's inside, all we can see is the silvery blue light that illuminates their faces when it's opened. Theo pulls out the broken, rusted sword he's been hiding in the Southlands, and as it whispers to him, he notices a glimmer of fire in the shattered blade. Just then, an oozing trickle of blood emerges from his hand wound and creeps toward the sword like an earthworm. It hisses and sizzles as it makes contact, igniting the flicker of fire in the sigil. But instead of emitting smoke, it appears to inhale it, converting the smoke to metal and remaking itself in front of Theo's eyes. Theo's response to Bronwyn's call is ominous, yes, mother. I'm prepared. Galadriel and Halbrand have escaped the storm as they flee the town. When their raft drifts into the shadow of a large ship, a mysterious caped figure on deck silhouetted by the finally shining sun, 